Welcome to the Great Egg of Zutomir, or as the rest of humankind knows it, the Mirpolder. I found this place whilst browsing through Google Maps, and my attention was arrested by this giant egg shape sat right there on the landscape. What led to this strangely shaped feature, and would it be a nice place to visit? Well, it turns out to have a more interesting history than you could guess. It's a tale that tells us much about the region's history, from prehistory and the Romans through to war, flood, the high technology of land reclamation, and post-colonial fossil fuel requirements. And it's a beautiful place to bike around as well. Now join me for a look at this landscape and its history. Our tale starts with prehistory, when a large area of this region was a wild and extensive peat bog. Around 4000 BC it was cut off from the sea. With the land unable to drain, it became a swampy and hard to reach place, only visited by the hunters and fishermen who could access the area by boat. It's not known exactly when the lake that would become the Mirpolder formed, but at some time it did, sandwiched here between the old course of the Rhine to the north and the River Maas to the south. Now one of the more interesting things I discovered is that the old Rhine, which continues to exist to this day, was once the northern frontier of the Roman Empire in what they called Germania Inferior. Pretty rude if you ask me. Now, there was a major fort nearby in Leiden, and this line of control along the river held between about 50 and 250 AD. We move past the Roman era and jump to 1000 AD. A new power structure exists and the Counts of Holland think it's about time to make some more money out of this, as they see it, wasteland. They want it cultivated, so they set the local farmers to work cutting ditches through the peat that surrounds the lake. The farmers get a fantastic deal where they're allowed to drain the land and then they pay a donation from their future crops to the local count. Uh, a tax to use this new land they made with the sweat of their own brow. Nice. Nevertheless, within a few centuries the whole swamp around the lake was drained and in use, with churches, villages and farms dotted across the landscape. Zutomir itself is believed to have existed more than a thousand years ago. I found a single reference to it being a mining village, but I can't find out what it mined. However, it was a very small settlement. Uh, upon the reclaimed land, all was not well. As the peat dried, it settled lower and lower, eventually reaching the groundwater level. It was increasingly unsuitable for crops, though it could still be used for grazing. Uh, from about the year 1400, windmills began to be used to lower the water level and keep the land dry. This brings us to the draining of the lake itself. The 1600s are a time of great upheaval and war. Battles were fought near here at the end of the preceding century, and now more than a hundred thousand displaced people, originating from further to the south, have moved into the county of Holland. This, of course, led to a pressing need for housing, land and food. Much of the area was still covered in lakes, all used for peat cutting, and eyes turned towards its reclamation. The political structure at the time was one in which local lords ruled small areas within limits set out by their <coughs> betters with the title of Ambachscher, Jacob Ohm van Weingarden was the local lord of Zutermeer. He also purchased these same rights to the neighbouring Zechwart. Between these, he was entitled to catch fish and birds from the lake, but this wasn't a tremendously profitable endeavour. Perhaps this was the motivation to drain the lake. Uh, imagine that, a powerful elite remaking the world to fatten their wallets. But must be said that in this instance the locals surely needed more usable agricultural land. So here was an unused area which was close to local markets, not too big to drain, it does not have too many owners to negotiate with, and it might even be possible to use it for the country homes of the wealthy wanting to escape summer in the cities. But Jacob wasn't so big time he could take this on alone. He needed investors and experts to help him get this done. Once he was granted permission for the project, he worked with a large number of investors and engineers to drain the lake. This was the first reclamation of its type in South Holland. The process involved first blocking the local watercourses that led to and from the lake. 
then the lake was encircled with a distinctive ring-shaped ditch which originally caught my eye on the map. Now this was all hard, manual work using men, shovels, wheelbarrows and small boats. Hard work, but nothing new or complicated. However, removing the water would need something a little newer, a bit more high-tech. Well, high-tech for 1615. The lake itself was relatively deep water, and this would present a problem for the use of windmills as usual. A mill can raise water by around 2 metres at the maximum, and they needed more lift than that. Towards the end of the previous century, the use of multiple mills in a series had been patented, and one of the wonderful things about the Meerpolder is that you can still see how this worked. Uh, with an overhead view, we can see the remaining bases of the windmills, and between them, the waterways that connected them. The southmost mill is the lowest, around 5 metres below present day sea level, and close to the lowest point of the polder. We can see that the modern drainage system leads straight from this mill to the ring ditch, with a modern pumping station doing the job with ease. But leading northwest to the middle mill is another water course. So the first mill would raise the water up into here from the network of ditches across the base of the lake. The second mill would then raise the water from here to the next channel, sending it to the third mill which stands upon the banks of the ring itself. And thus the third mill moves the water into the ring, and from there it can flow away, presumably under gravity back then, though I'm sure there's more pumping needed elsewhere these days as the land continues to settle. All in all, a great example of how the modern country that is the Netherlands began this long process of taming its lowland areas, even the tougher parts like this. Once draining began, it was actually done within a year. By 1616, 540 hectares of arable land had been created. To get it ready to sow, hundreds more ditches were dug, draining to the windmill system to give usable fields. This new land was split for administration, with two-thirds going to the Zoetermeer region and one-third to Stompwijk. The actual ownership of the fields was divided amongst the investors in 30 lots. Now, the wealth produced by the land would be theirs, all but for a single percent which was kept as alms for the poor. This was called the Godsacker. I've seen this translated as God's Field, but gosh, it does sound like God's Acre, doesn't it? Learning some Dutch gives some fascinating insights into the etymology of quite a lot of English words. And here's the finished product in a beautiful map from about 1810. We see the southeast section here with the plots, the farms, and if we zoom in, here's the mills still doing their jobs 200 years after the polder was drained. In fact, they remained in use until 1926, over 300 years of use until a more modern solution was installed. And here they and the polder still are, over 400 years on from the reclamation of this land. I think Jacob, his investors, engineers, labourers, and everyone else who's maintained and worked this land can be proud. It's a great legacy to have left behind such a, a useful and beautiful place. And so, life has gone on over the centuries. The land has been used for crops and grazing, and farm buildings dot the edges of the polder. Zutomir has grown, at first slowly, but in the 20th century very fast indeed. Uh, we see it as a tiny hamlet on this map from about 1810, but today it's a city of 127,000 people. The railway came in 1868, which spurred some growth, opening new markets for local produce and hugely improving connections to the wider world. But things really kick off in 1962, when plans were put forward to develop the village into a city of over 100,000 people. It was to be a modern, well-designed city. There would be green space and a light railway making a ring about the city to connect the neighbourhoods. Circles seem like a bit of a theme for Zutomir. Each neighbourhood would have its own amenities centred upon the train stations. And in 1984, the Government Ministry for Education, Culture and Science was moved to Zutomir to provide more employment with a huge new building, sited on the Europaweg, and it was for many years the largest building by floor space in Europe. As for the polder itself, it's had one major departure from its agrarian character over the centuries. In fact, it was changed by a high demand for petroleum, World War II, and colonial decline. 
Uh, the Netherlands sourced much of its oil from the Dutch East Indies before World War II, but of course these were occupied by the Japanese during the global unpleasantness. From the reading I've done, it sounds like relations between the inhabitants and the Dutch, and then with the Japanese, were quite complicated. Uh, suffice to say, independence movements that had existed for some time were not willing to find themselves back under Dutch control after the Japanese surrender, and they declared independence shortly after that surrender, and whilst the Japanese were still administering Indonesia. Uh, wars for control continued until 1949, uh, when independence was accepted. But back to oil. The Netherlands started searching their own lands for it, and a joint venture between oil companies was formed, uh, known as NAM. A small field was found in the region of the Meerpolder, and drilling commenced in 1957. Judging from the few archive pictures I can find, uh, it certainly changes the character of the place a bit. Uh, there were multiple sites pumping on the Meerpolder, and production continued at a declining rate until it was finally shut down in 1991. And this brings us back to the present day, where the polder is once again a peaceful place used for farming and recreation. I've circled the ring upon my trusty steed and learned so much about its history and wider context, and it all started as a strange shape on a map. To me, this is the joy to be found in small oddities. You never know where something will lead. So often you can gain a greater sense of what's around you, what's come before, and the connections between things. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little more about this place. It's a great spot to visit, easy to access by car and bike, and I'd fully recommend getting out here to enjoy some fresh air and great views if you're in the area. So that's the end of the tale about how some egg-shaped fields can encompass the founding conflicts of a nation, uh, its human costs, new technology and ingenuity, and even come to be affected by a global war on the other side of the planet. This is a completely new type of video for me to make, and I think as a new resident in the Netherlands, and as someone who enjoys learning and sharing things about the places around me, it's a good way to get out there and, and do just that. The research and writing has certainly taken some time, but who doesn't love a good rabbit hole of increasingly obscure websites? Time permitting, I uh, hope to do some more of these. Uh, in fact, while researching this, I've come up on the fact that the Romans built a canal nearby, stretching from Leiden to the River Mass. Much of the route's still in use today is a canal called the Fleet, so perhaps that would be a good trip to do and see where it leads me. Enjoy your day, stay curious, I'll see you around.